never had a slow clap. That's uh, now I have to live up to it. Fantastic. Hey, what a great day. What a wonderful day. My name's Dave Tish. I'm new here and I don't know a lot of you, but I'm super eager to get to know you. What a great day. Beautiful weather. Earthquakes won last night and there's something else today. Um, oh yeah, Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Now, if you're a mom, could you do this for me? If you're a mom, could you just raise your hand? I'm not going to have you stand up. You already do too much work. Um, <laughs> So these are moms. Now, how about this? The rest of us, why don't we stand up and applaud mom? Raise your hand. All right. All right, mothers. All right, mothers. Woo. Man, that's great. Moms are thinking that was too short. That, that did not last long enough. And it didn't. You know, I, I don't, you, many of you don't know my story. I'm actually... Uh, I'm adopted, and so um, if you're, in a, I want to do something. This, if, if you're an adopted uh, mom, if if you um, are a foster parent, or you raise somebody who's maybe not biologically your son or daughter, but they are your son or daughter by God's grace, could you just raise your hand too? I just want to applaud you. Thank you guys so much for for doing that. That's awesome. And we have the opportunity to also partner with Compassion. We're super excited to do that. We're in the middle of a sermon series now called um, Bubble Wrapped, A Life Packed with Hope. And we're in the middle of that series. And we're going to talk today about Mary. And we're super excited about it. There's so much exciting things going on. The folks in the theater over there, um, we're, we're excited to have you here. And if you're listening from the new Branham campus, then you've gotten in a time machine and gone forward in time because it's not open yet. But it is going to open soon. <laughs> On Father's Day, June 15th, we're opening our brand new Branham campus. We're super excited, and we actually put together, Andy Gridley and all the, the, the South Campus team there at Branham Campus, they put together these like prayer guides. And these are not just for people who are going to the Branham campus, these are for all of us, because like all of us as a community, we're, it's like kind of having a baby. It's affecting all of us. And so um, it's super exciting. We have prayer guides out there, because this isn't just about the South um, Branham campus, this is about all of us and the kingdom work. So we're super excited. The prayer guides are out there. A lot of exciting stuff going on. And we're going to delve in today to look at um, the, the story of Mary in the Bible. But before we do, can we just pause and can we just pray? Because I'm terrified and uh, that would be great. And um, let's just open up the word of God in, in, in a second. But let's just pray and just quiet our hearts here. And uh, will you bow your heads with me as we pray? Jesus, thank you for Mother's Day and for moms and what they show us about your great love. I pray that as we open up your word, and as I say something, that, that my words would go further than they should because it's your Holy Spirit moving in, and I pray that as we look at the story of Mary, that our hearts would be, receive something from you this morning in a way that's transformative and can change us. It's in your name we pray, amen. You know, I was asking my friends, what is it about moms? And I said, if you had a, an adjective to describe what it is that a mom is, what, what kind of adjective would you use? What, what, kind of, what are the three best adjectives to describe moms? And so uh, these words kept floating up. So if, it's, if, if you don't like these words, blame my friends, they're stupid. Um, <laughs> the first word that keeps coming up was care. Moms care, right? Moms always care. Moms love, they care. Sometimes moms care a little too much. You know what I mean? They care a little bit too much. When I was little, my mom's always like, put on a jacket. You're going to catch pneumonia and die in a ditch somewhere. I'm like, mom, there's not even any ditch. I did not live in a high ditch area. I don't understand what's going on. Moms care. Moms care. Moms also, of course, they, they nurture, right? They nurture. Moms, even from the time conception happens, they nurture inside their body. They have this parasite living inside them, like sucks all their nutrients out. And it's just they nurture, they create this nurturing environment, and then it doesn't stop there. They just always are creating nurturing environments to make sure their children can grow and flourish. And then the last thing, of course, is moms protect, right? Moms, you ever, you ever cross that mama bear kind of thing? You know what I mean? It's like, whoa, they, they, you know, mama bear, they kind of they protect. They care, they nurture, they protect. That's what moms do, right? That's just the essence of moms. 
But it's not just moms, I mean, it's everybody, right? Everybody has something that they want to care or nurture or protect. That's, there were, there, I was at the gym the other day and there's this guy who really wanted to care and nurture and protect his biceps. He, was, he could not keep his eyes off them, you know? And, and frankly, neither could I. Um, and that's why I don't work out with Steve anymore. It's just a stumbling block. No good, just no good. He's not here, is he? Right? No. Oh, he's, he, yeah, he's preaching at Awakening. That's right. So I'm safe to say that. All right. Edit this out, guys. Um, so that's what we all want to care and nurture and protect something. We all have something we deeply want to care for or nurture or protect. We all have that. But here's the problem. And if you've been a mom for a while or just been uh, living in life, you know this. Here's the problem with caring and nurturing and protecting that instinct is that no matter how, how hard we try, no matter how much we care, no matter how much we want to try to create those nurturing environments or want to protect, there is nothing we can do. There's not enough love in the world, not enough nurturing environments in the world to protect those that we love from this fallen world. This world is broken, it is violent, it is chaotic, it is confusing, and we can never, no matter how much effort and time and love and care and attention we put towards something, we can never fully protect our loved ones and the things we love from this fallen, broken fragmented, chaotic world. And some of us know that all too well. And this is the story of Mary, isn't it? This is the story of Mary. I mean, think about Mary, in the earthly mother of Jesus. The second that she finds out in the Annunciation that she's going to become the earthly mother of the Messiah, her life spirals out of control. I mean, she loses control of her body, but for the grace of God and an angel, she would have lost her husband, the social scorn and derision that would have been visited upon her was massive. She would have been a social outcast. Then all of a sudden, she, she leaves. She has to ride on a donkey at nine months pregnant to give birth, not in a hospital or a clinic or even in the comfort of home, but in a borrowed room, a stable nonetheless. Now, when my wife was seven and a half months pregnant, we drove down to SoCal in a Camry, and that was awful. Imagine a donkey. I mean, that's just rough. But even more than that, right after that, when the wise men come, Joseph gets a dream that says flee from Herod because he's trying to kill this child. And so in the middle of the night, they flee to Egypt and they become political refugees. They're political refugees for years. Then they return to the region in Galilee. And now they're still afraid of what Herod's son is going to do. They kind of live in fear. And so they move north. Then her husband dies. And then her son grows up, becomes an itinerant preacher, gets a following. But then he's unjustly accused. He's imprisoned. He's imprisoned. He's tortured, and he's killed in front of her eyes on a cruel cross. And there's nothing that Mary can do. There's no love that she can have to stop this. There's no environment that she can create to protect her son from this. And this is life. This is the reality. And you would think that would lend itself to hopelessness. You would think in the middle of this that she would descend into depression and hopelessness, but she does not. And I think if we can look at the life of Mary and we can see what she did, we can see that Mary is not special or different or rarefied in some sort of different way, that the very things that Mary did to keep her soul buoyant, to maintain hope in the midst of hopeless situations, to not be overwhelmed by the reality of this fallen, broken world, the very same things that Mary did, we can do, you and I can do. We have the same access to the same power and the same things, the same God. And so I wanna look at the things that Mary did to maintain hope in the midst of hopelessness, to, to not be overwhelmed by the hopelessness of her circumstances, to allow her soul to remain buoyant. And my prayer is that as we do this, as we look at the life of Mary, something inside of us will say, I can do that too. And we can follow Mary's example to not lose hope. So the first, there's two instances I want to, to want to look at in the life of Mary. And the first is when she finds out that she's going to be the earthly mother of the Messiah. It's there in Luke 1. It's also there in your notes. It's also in your Bible, because that's where I copied and pasted it and put it into the notes from. <laughs> Thank you for that laugh. I, I thought that was funny, too. <laughs> the angel appears to Mary and says to her, greetings, you who are highly favored. Now, highly favored. This, this term is used of only three people in the entire Bible. 
Moses, Noah, and Mary, and that's it. So she's in rarefied form here. But, but what the angel says to her is, is, is this, it's called the Annunciation. She, she's gonna be the earthly mother of Jesus. And then what happens immediately after that is Mary breaks forth into song. She sings a song. And like all songs and all art, it comes from her soul because all art, everything we create comes from our soul. And so as we look at the song, I want you to see What's in Mary's soul? It's incredible. And I think it's instructive for us to move forward into hope. This is what Mary says. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the, whole, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped to serve in Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, there's much in this psalm. There's much in the song that Mary sings from her heart, from her soul. But I wanted to point out a couple things. There's two things that just jump out at me. The first is the repetition of these phrase servant and humble. Mary is clearly someone who says, God, I know this is going to be difficult, but I'm your servant and I'll put myself in this position to trust you. But the second thing is look how often she references the past generations before generations will call me blessed he has remembered he has performed mighty deeds with his arms he's brought down rulers he helped his servant israel remembering to be merciful to abraham and his descendants just as he promised our ancestors there's a real focus in this poem in this song of mary on the past and this is the first aspect of hope that is totally counterintuitive, but totally necessary, is that in order to spring forward into hope, we must remember the past and what God has done. This is a stalwart, and in all scriptures, Jesus, Jesus models this, but all through the Old Testament, God commands his people to remember it's the second most popular command in the Old Testament besides fear not. And often right after fear not is remember. Remember. The Israelites are told to remember. There's a series of festivals that God institutes simply because he wants Israel to remember. And it's never, hey, remember how bad that was? Man, that Pharaoh guy, he was a real tool. It's never that. It's always remember who I was and what I did for you. It's always the focus of it was to remember what God did. There's these moments where after God does something, he has the Israelites make a, a monument of stones. and says, remember, he does that frequently. There's a guy on our curriculum team. I get a chance to work with a curriculum team that, that writes the questions for the sermons and, and works with Steve and does all these things. It's really cool, but there's a guy on this curriculum team. His name's Bob, Bob Frazee, and he, he has these journals, and he calls them piles of rocks, which I thought was weird, because I'm like, well, if anything, it's a pile of wood there, Bob. <laughs> but it's a reference to the Old Testament and how the Israelites would make a pile of rocks to remember what God has done. And he says, I'm going to keep a journal of the ways that God is faithful and has been faithful to me in the present. Because there will come a moment where I will become discouraged and I want to have a record of what God has done in my life. If you are facing discouraging circumstances, if you are in the middle of it, then perhaps the best thing you can do for your soul is to make a list of every way that you can remember and think of, of ways that God has been faithful to you. Make lists. Remember what God has done. And as you look back on your life, you will see that God has been faithful and active in your life. There's that thing that they say on all the investment companies. Past performance is no indicator of future performance, right? They always say that. But with God, it's the opposite. Past performance is a way 
to gain hope of what is now and what will be. See, this is where Mary gets it. She looks at what God has done, sees the kind of God he is, realizes in the present that that's the same kind of God, and then uses that to springboard into the future. And this is where the Pharisees and the Sadducees just miss it. They use the past, but they're stuck in the past. They never begin to consider what God is doing now and what he might be doing in the future. See, this is the difference. Mary gets it. So we must remember. We must be people that remember and recall what God has done for us. Now, some of you might say, well, that's easy for you. You know God and you've had a a track history with him. But I, I I I haven't been walking with the Lord that long, or maybe you're just checking things out. And you say, I I don't know much about what God has done in my life. I can't think of, of those kinds of examples. Does your advice no longer apply to me? To which I would say, no. Thank you for laughing. That was a joke, just so. See, here's the amazing thing uh, about life with God that I realized. I became a Christian uh, after college, so I was kind of a late convert to to Jesus. But what happened is as I looked back on my life, and this is the amazing thing with God, as I looked back on my life, there were moments before I was even walking with God, before I even knew anything about him, where I assumed that I was completely alone, that God was not active in my life. And after I became a Christian, and the longer I walked with him, the more I look back on my life, the more I see that moments where I was convinced that I was completely alone, God was with me even then. The opposite was true. God was active and at work in my life before I even was aware of him. This is the crazy thing about God. It's like the movie The Sixth Sense. Have you seen that film, The Sixth Sense? There's this kind of surprise, anybody? Come, any, okay, oh my God. There's like four of you. I was like, this illustration is not gonna work unless a crucial mass of you get this. Well, there's a, um, there's a surprise ending and I don't wanna give everything away, but everyone's dead. And, um, <laughs> and, and you know the twist ending I'm talking about. You know the twist ending at the end and you look and, and the second it happens, you're like, yo. Oh! And all of a sudden, these moments in the film, which previously had an entirely different meaning, take on an entirely different meaning. And you're like, oh, right? There's that moment, right? And and all of a sudden, the ending illuminates the entire film. Life with Jesus is just like that. That's what life with Jesus is. He illuminates your entire past. And so remember... Like Mary, we must be people who remember what God is and what he has done, not just in our personal lives. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knit us together in our mother's womb. And there's that weird verse that says, before the foundations of the earth were formed, Jesus died for us. I have no idea what that means, but that sounds cool. God has been at work before we were even conceived. And this is the principle of remembering. And in remembering, we remember that God has been faithful to us then and he's not gonna stop now. And that somehow gives us buoyancy in our soul to spring forward into hope. Now the second thing I wanna point to in the life of Mary, it happens on the cross. And like the first one, it's also a song. There's this moment where Jesus is being crucified and Mary is is with at the foot of the cross. She's there with John and the other Mary. So Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus, is there. And Matthew records that, that on the cross, Jesus... I just like to think for a second what that must have been like for Mary to watch her son. But she's there... And she hears her son cry out, and Matthew records this. Jesus cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And and translated, that means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now here's the thing about that. Theologians and poets have struggled with what in the world that means for generations. 
But there's this moment where Mary would have heard that. Now, the thing about that is that m- many people, you would think, oh, Jesus is saying just a, 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 something of incredible despair. His father has abandoned him. But it's not. It's actually the first line of a song. Jesus is singing on the cross. The first line of a song, Psalm 22. And see, Mary, who would have been a student of the text because she was a Jewish girl, she would have been schooled up to the age of 13. She would have memorized Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and all of Psalms because her job as a woman was to be prepared to lead worship for her family. She would have memorized all of those sacred texts. I'd like you to think about that for a second. A 13-year-old girl would have memorized all of that before you feel too good about yourself and your spiritual maturity, a 13-year-old girl would have memorized all that. And see, the thing about songs is not only can songs transport you back to your life. You ever done that? You ever heard a song and you're like, oh, that's my jam, right? You know what I'm talking about? And there's other times you hear that song and you're like, oh man, it just reminds you of that. And there's other times you're like, I don't ever wanna hear that song again, right? Right? Mbop, right, whatever. (laughs) Just deleted. (laughs) Seven of you got that joke. Thank you for that. I I appreciate that. The point is, the songs have this ability and power to, to actually draw you in. But even more than that, the thing about songs, the power of songs, is if I sing the first line of a song, the rest of the song comes cascading into your memory like a waterfall. That's the power of songs. So... For example, for those of you who are a little bit older, if I were to sing the first line of this, here's the story of a lovely lady. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. (laughs) Right? You know that. I just say the first line so the rest of the song comes into your mind. For those of you who are a little younger, right? In West Philadelphia, born and raised. There it is, right? You know, some of you are like, what is that song? (laughs) To which I say, I am sorry, you're so old. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, Now, now, now I have no popularity. All right, great, fantastic. All right, here's the point, here's the point. Songs have that power, they have that power to hearken back not only to a time and a place, but the rest of the song comes flooding in. That's the power of songs. When Jesus is on the cross and he begins singing and saying the first line of this song, the rest of the song, which would have been memorized and known in the heart of Mary, would have come flooding in. That's the power of songs. And I want to show you what Psalm 22 is. Because it's shocking. This is Psalm 22. This is the song that Jesus is singing on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? Now, does this sound like something that Jesus is going through? Remember, this psalm was written by King David 1,000 years before Jesus was ever born. I am a worm, not a man. Scorned and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Now this is interesting. Because it's not just, David's not just saying they mock me. He lists a specific taunt. And that specific taunt just happened to have been a specific taunt leveled at him mere minutes before. By the thief. If you're God, get yourself down off this cross. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. This would have literally been happening. Jesus' shoulders would have been dislocated. My heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. Now this seems like metaphor, but this is literally happening to Jesus. Jesus. Physiologists and doctors and physicians tell us what's literally happening to Jesus in this moment is after he's scourged, his back would have been ripped open. Not just the epidermis, but the muscles. 
Many people say that it's likely that his vertebrae and even his ribs could have been partially quasi-exposed. He would have been bleeding profusely. And then they put the robe on him and that would have served like a bandage, a coagulant. But then they ripped that off. And there he is and he is losing a tremendous amount of blood. In his body, in desperation, his heart is trying to send blood and it's life-giving nutrients and oxygen to the ruined parts of his body. And it's pumping, but he's lost so much blood that his blood, and there's so much water that his blood is thick. So thick that his heart has to work in overdrive to try to get it to those parts of the body. And his heart is overworking. And there's this moment after he's passed, after he's dead, when the Roman centurion pierces his side with a spear. And it says that out gushed blood and water. Now, that might not seem like any point, but what's going on there, physicians tell us, is that there is a sac of fluid around your heart called the pericardium. And the pericardium is a sac of fluid that protects your heart. And it's, it's just water. This is this liquid around your heart. And if it's mixed with blood and water, that means that something is burst inside your heart. In order, a blood vessel or the heart ventricles themselves. Jesus died, quite literally, of a broken heart. His heart would have been trying desperately, pounding with furiousness to save that body. His heart was literally melting within him. And then it says this. My mouth is dried up like sun-baked clay and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. There's this moment on the cross where Jesus says, I thirst. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. I mean, do you see this? Do you see how specific this is? And how these things are actually happening to Jesus? Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. And then this one, they pierce my hands and my feet. This is written a thousand years before Jesus was ever born. And even more than that, these things, by all historical and biblical accounts, never happened to David. These things never happened to David. So why is he writing them down? What is going on here? And why is Jesus singing this song on the cross? Now, in my life, I've only written one song. I am a terrible songwriter. I'm an amazing singer and vocalist. Terrible songwriter. (laughs) Why are you laughing? You don't know. I'm terrible. Yeah, anyway. I wrote one song. That's it. I've only written one song, and it was for my son. And when he was really little, he had this attachment. I have two children. Uh, I think we have a picture of my kids, just so you get to. These are my children. That is my son now. He's much, much older now. He's nine. His name is Justice. And that is my daughter, JL, who is seven in July. She is my princess. And they, we, we were dressed up to go to a wedding, uh, just so you don't think we're like super formal in our home. Or, Put on your tie, son. Yeah. We're not like that. Um, but this is a picture of them. And, and this is actually a picture of my son when he was little. This is my little guy when he was, yeah, it looks like he's chewing on an electrical cord, doesn't it? Yeah. It wasn't plugged in. No, it's actually the rope to a sled. We were visiting family in in Michigan, and there's this moment when my son was so little, he hated going to bed. He hated it, hated going to bed. He hated going to bed. He hated being, he had like separation anxiety. It's like the second I would walk away out of his view, he'd be like, hey, where'd the big guy go? Where'd he go? Oh, he's gone forever! Right? It's like, calm down, getting some pampers. Jeez. You know what I mean? Kids, you know, anybody else ever had to deal with that? You know, the kids, and so I, I wrote him a song. I wrote him a song. And uh, would you like to hear it? Yes. Well, it's part of the sermon. You don't have a choice. Anyway, so <laughs> I'm going to sing the song that I wrote for my son. Here it goes. Ready? I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. And even if you think I am, I'll be right back. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. I know. You can download that later on iTunes. There it is. <laughs> Number one seller. The remix. I would sing that song to my son uh, to let him know, this kind of cheer little ditty, hey, I'm not going anywhere, and even if you think I am, I'll be right back. This kind of feel, right? That's what I would do. Why do parents, why do mothers sing lullabies to their kids? To comfort them in times of great distress. 
And don't you see? A thousand years before Jesus was even born, God wrote a lullaby for his son to comfort him in his moment of greatest stress. But this song is not a depressing song. I want to show you how this psalm ends, the end of the song. Because again, when the first line of a song is sung, it's not just the first or middle stanzas, it's the end of the song that comes to mind. I want to show you the end of this psalm. Look, this is not a song of depression or abandonment. This is a song of triumph. All the ends of the earth will remember and they will turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring it to a people yet unborn. He has done it. Translated, it is done. Another translation, it is finished. That is what God is doing. This is not a song of abandonment, though it starts with that. It ends with, God, I know you're doing a thing to bring, and posterity will worship you, and that you will be proclaimed to a generation yet unborn. That's us. Jesus is singing a song of triumph, a psalm of God's victory. This is what was, he was singing. And Mary at the foot of the cross would have heard that, would have saw that, would have seen it, would have realized that this is what was going on. I'm not making this stuff up. It's all right there in the text. This is what God wrote to his son. And this is what his son was singing back to his father. Don't you see? See, sometimes in life, In order to go forward and to hope, we have to look back at God's faithfulness. But sometimes we have to look up and see exactly what kind of God is at the center of this universe. It's this kind of God, the kind of God who writes a song for his son, the kind of God who sings that song back to his father, the kind of God who, and this is the most amazing thing of all, In John 17, it says the same way that God loves Jesus, he loves us. Miracle of miracles. And if you let that sink in, if you realize that this is the kind of God that exists, this is the kind of God who lives, this is the kind of God who invites us into his relationship with us, then all of a sudden, hope becomes eternal. And no matter how bad things get, because we have spiritual amnesia, don't we? We forget so easily who God is and what he's about and what he has done. But if we can refocus and remember, all of a sudden things can change and hope can become an ever-present companion because of this God we let that just sink in that can change everything. And so what should we do? We should listen. Listen to the song that God is singing to his son. Listen to the song that God is singing and has been singing to you since before you were even born. Listen to the song that God is and always has been singing, a song of love, a song of come home, a song of of sacrifice for our benefit. This is the kind of God that we have. As we close, I'm gonna invite the band to come up and I want us to just think about this for a second. I want this to sink in, the song that God is singing. Because if we get this, everything can change. And like Mary, who looked back in order to understand her future and reflected on God's faithfulness as a way to be lifted into hope into the future. And like Mary, who would have heard her son singing the song, the song of triumphant victory, the song written for her boy, 
by his father a thousand years before he was even born. She never gave in to hopelessness or despair. She was never a victim. There's this moment where Luke interviews her. And we know that Luke interviewed her because it says in, in, in this little throwaway line in Luke that, that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Now, how in the world would Luke have known that unless Mary had told him? See, even 30 years after her son's death and resurrection, Mary was telling everyone who would listen the stories of what God was doing. Let's do the same. Because God is standing in front of all of us saying this, I'm right here. I'm not going anywhere. And even if you think I am, I'll be right back. This is the promise of God. This is the truth of God. This is the truth of you and I. And this truth can lift us out of any circumstance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may this be so in our hearts. May we look back and see how faithful you have been to us. May we never forget the things that you have done. May we be a community that proclaims that to each other. And God, may we never stop looking up and seeing and getting a revelation and a picture of just how gorgeous and loving and beautiful your love for us is. May we live in this and may it move us always toward hope. Amen.